Hello and welcome to another edition of James and Chris Science Videos, where today we've got a bit of a mammoth video today. I'm going to try and go through the whole of the plant reproductive system in one video. Um, should be ambitious. Let's start then. We, we're going to start with uh, the fact that plants can do two types of reproduction, which sounds rather kinky. Uh, the two types of reproduction are sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. We need a quick definition of both. And there's one we're going to focus on and one that we're going to ignore. Now, the two types, sexual reproduction, involves sharing of genes across two parents. So you need a male gamete and you need a female gamete, and those two need to come together and they need to be from separate uh, parents. So one from a, a mum and a dad, and there's usually a male and a female, they come together um, to produce a zygote, which would then grow into a new organism. Asexual reproduction is where you only need one parent, and it's, it's basically cloning. Uh, plants are able to do that, and there's lots of different methods that they can use. I've just put three at the bottom. Um, potato tubers. Tubers per, um, grow at the bottom on the roots. So a potato plant grows, and it starts putting all its um, energy as a store in the potatoes. If I take that potato away and plant it, then it will start to grow into a new plant again. And that plant will be genetically identical to the parent plant. It's a, it's a cloned version. Um, you might have seen strawberry runners. So you've got a strawberry plant, and all the way through the summer, they grow these stems that come off, and at the end of them is a little mini strawberry plant. And if that grats onto the ground, it grows roots. And when it grows roots, it then produces a completely identical, genetically identical um, strawberry plant. So those are our kind of methods. I've, I've put cutting as well. If, if you ever tried this, if you cut a branch off a plant and then put it into water, then that will develop roots and that will start to grow as well. And gardeners use that technique quite a lot. If they've got a plant they really like, they'll take a cutting from that plant and they'll cultivate it to grow into a genetically identical plant, which is, you know, really useful. But we are looking, particularly today, at the sexual reproduction plants, where you need two different parents. We're going to go to the lab now where Mr. Kipax is going to show you the flower, which is the reproductive organ of a plant. See you in a couple of minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Right, what we're going to do now is look at the structure of the flower. As said before, the flower, the whole reason that's there, is the site of the reproduction for the plant. Like the plant is made up of four different parts, the flower, the stem, the roots and the leaves, the main flower itself, again, is made up of four different major structures. Um, we can get into more detail, but we'll just start the four major parts. If you look at our lovely little uh, plant here, or flower, should I say, here, nice and big. I've not seen one quite growing like this in my garden. Um, maybe it's sort of almost trippy looking. But you can see the four different major centres of the flower. Down here, these parts in green. And if I hold it up, actually, you may be able to see part. When a flower first starts growing, you'll notice, I think um, poppies are particularly good for this one. As the poppy starts growing and the flower grows, you'll see that you have a green pod at the top of the, uh, of the plant. Now, that pod actually contains all of the parts of the flower. They're just tightly packed in there. And as a child, one of my favourite things to do was, if you're walking through a field of poppies, was to play a nice little random game. You pick the bud and try and guess the colour of the leaves within it. And you have different coloured uh, poppies, so either reds and whites and things like that. Mostly I seem to pick white ones where everybody else seems to get much more colourful ones. Why are we talking about poppies? Well, because those green parts of that bud are remaining on our diagram or our model here. And you can see these parts down here. This is the part that would have been closed up on this flower, protecting all the vital parts within this plant because this is the next generation. This is going to produce the seeds that give us the next generation year after year of this plant. So as these delicate parts are growing and developing and maturing, then they're kept in a shell under these parts here. And these green parts are known as the sepal. S-E-P-A-L, the sepal protector. That. Now once that's matured, and you'll see this, this happens, the, the flower pops out, comes out of the bud, and the sepal will then literally die off and they'll, they're no longer needed. The plant doesn't need to resource these anymore, so they will slowly die off. And you can see them, if you do buy some flowers, you can often see the remains of the bud underneath. Now, moving on from there, we have the brightly coloured petals. Um, these petals are not truly part of the reproductive part of the plant. These are here 
as an advertisement. You know, you see advertisements on TV. You might even see uh, teenage males uh, who are grooming themselves, making themselves look really, really uh, so-called attractive to the opposite sex, uh, and advertising that they're this, 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 this great species. Well, this is what the plant's doing. It's using its petals to advertise this plant is ready. It's ready for fertilization. Um, and it's going to advertise itself to, uh, particularly this one, to insects. This bright coloured uh, advertisement stands out and a bee might be quite far distance away, but it will see these colours. It will also be attracted by a, a smell produced by the inside of this plant here that tells the bee there's a reward here waiting. And the plants produce some nectar down here to uh, advertise to the bees, come and get the nectar because this plant will require the bees' help in order to fertilise. So they're just a gigantic advertisement. Hey, nectar's ready bees because I need help in fertilisation. So, sepal underneath, protected our, our grown bud, petals, advertising. And then we come to the nuts and bolts of actually the reproductive parts of the plant. Now, anytime you come to a plant, um, another nice little thing to do, I quite like, I don't know why, I just like pulling these bits off plants. Um, and actually in my household, that's a very, very important thing to do. So one of the odd occasions that I buy my wife flowers, first thing I do is I'll pull these things off. And you might already know why this is. This is the male reproductive part of the plant. This is known as the stamen. And the stamen is held up by what we call a filament uh, that attaches down to the bottom of the flower here. And right at the end of the filament is the anther. And the anther has lots and lots and lots of grains. These are known as the pollen grains. Pollen is the plant's gamete or sex cells. So within humans, we talk about uh, the male sex being the sperm. The plants will have pollen. And these pollen grains are really easy to knock off with your finger. If you come to a, uh, a mature flower, literally just touching or brushing your hand against them will take the pollen grains off. Um, and that uh, is important in my household because those pollen grains are associated with hay fever. Uh, we've got a couple of people in our, our family who have hay fever, so we just take those off to stop that happening in the house. Now, that's the male part, the stamen, male sex cells sitting at the end. And then you come to the more complicated part of the plant, which is the females. And again, within humans, the reproductive part of the female is a lot more complicated than the male part. The same goes for the uh, for the female part of the plant. This whole structure in the middle here is the female reproductive system, otherwise known as the carpal. At the top, you have an entrance to, uh, to the carpal. This part here is quite sticky you know, on a plant. If you put your fingers on it, sometimes you can actually feel it. And the reason it's sticky is that you want a bee to come and push itself against some of the pollen, hopefully from a different plant, um, and bring that pollen and then brush against the stigma. If it brushes against the stigma, some of this pollen will come off and it will stick to what I call the sticky stigma. Um, that will start the process of reproduction in the plant, what we call the process of uh, pollination. Second part to the female reproductive uh, structure, so we've got the top is the, uh, is the stigma. This long tube part here is known as the style, and this gives us the entrance down so what's the most important part in here is, is the store of the eggs within the plant. Now, different flowers will have a different amount of eggs. The proper name for the, uh, for the egg cells within a plant is the ovule, um, and they are stored in the ovary. Now, different plants will have a different amount. Some plants will have lots and lots of these. In fact, uh, dozens or hundreds. Other plants might just have one of these. It depends on how the plant uh, has adapted to its environment to how many it will have. So let's just recap. Uh, female part of the plant is the carpal, stigma on top, going down the style, into the ovary, and then the ovules inside. Male part of the plant is the stamen, with the filament holding up the anther, which has the pollen. That's our reproductive part. Petals are there to attract insects, to say that this part is ready. And then lastly, underneath was the sepal, which is no longer needed on this uh, flower that grew and protected the flower before it grew.
Okay, welcome back. So you've looked at the different parts of a flower. So on this screen, I've got a diagram of a flower that will be good for you to get into your notes. I've put next to it a table. So you'll need to be able to identify each of the parts of a flower, but also describe the function. And the function is what it does. So I've put the keywords down there on the side. It'd be a great idea for you to get that table done and to do the flower. So I'm going to pause the video and once you're done restart it, that would be a very good idea. Right, I assume we've done the table and the diagram. So here we are now on to something called vectors of pollination. I need to explain quickly what the word vector means. A vector is a method for transferring things from one place to another. So we talk about at the moment, it's quite, uh, quite a topic of discussion, we talk about vectors of disease, how a disease can transfer from one person to another. In pollination, a vector of pollination is how the pollen can get from one flower to another. I've put on the screen here a picture, this electron microscope scan of pollen. And you can see the different shapes and sizes of many different pollens. And the shapes and size indicate to us the method by which the pollen uses to transfer from stamen to stigma. The two methods are wind pollination and insect pollination. And I've got a picture here of a bumblebee collecting some nectar. And you can see, as it goes to feed on the nectar, the stamen rub against the insect, and you can see all the pollen grains get stuck on their hair. Now, those pollen grains are going to be the ones that you saw in the previous bit with spikes on it, and the spikes help it get attached to the hairs. And then that bee will fly to the next flower to collect some nectar, and as it lands on there, some of that pollen will rub on the stigmas. So that, that is the insect vector for pollination. Wind pollination is exactly what it sounds like. It uses the wind to carry the pollen across. Now, for this, um, I've, I've included a picture of a grass flower. Now, grass flowers and any wind pollinated flower do not need petals. And they have what we call dangly stamen, which sound quite cool. Dangly stamen are really long anthers and filaments, well the filament's very long, the anther dangles below the plant and every time there's a gust of wind it produces millions of particles of pollen and that pollen will travel in the wind. Now we go back to that original picture, they'll be the very small ones or the ones that look like they've got sails and kind of um, parts to help the wind push along. In order for this to work the plant needs to produce millions of grains of pollen and for those with hay fever, it's this particular pollen that creates issues for you. Now, when the pollen gets to the plant, it lands on the stigma. And we've got two processes that we need to understand. And those two processes are pollination and fertilization. We're going to go to back to the lab where Mr. Kipax will explain the difference between those two descriptions. Right, now we're going to talk about the actual process of pollination and fertilisation within this plant. These are two words that are uh, very, very commonly uh, mixed together or, or, or simply got wrong. Uh, pollination and fertilisation, two separate processes within the plant. What we're going to talk about, the first one, is pollination. So um, we're looking at our plant. We've talked about the structure of the uh, of the flower before uh, beforehand. This plant is ready for pollination. Its bright leaves have attracted the insects, and an insect will come along, probably a bee, but there are lots of pollinators. But so let's imagine that the bee comes along, and it's looking for. It's been attracted by the smell and the colour, and it's looking for nectar, and a nice little food source that the plant offers the bee for the job. But the bee will brush across perhaps one of the anthers and take off some of the pollen. And that will stick onto sort of the legs or the undercarriage of the, of the bee. As the bee moves along, it's going to brush against the top of the sticky stigma. And that pollen grain will uh, attach to the stigma. At this point, that is pollination of the plant completed. The plant is not fertilized because you haven't had the gametes uh, fusing, you haven't had the pollen and the uh, ovules fusing together, but um, it is in that process that it's ready for that process, well, it's ready for that to actually happen. So the bee's job is done, off it goes, it's got its nectar, thank you very much bee, and now the plant can actually do the magic. What happens is that the pollen grain will uh, be stuck on top of the sticky stigma. Now at this point, I'm going to try and push this back into my plant, 
doppelte Zeitblick. At this point, so the pollen grain has landed on top of the sticky stigma. The pollen grain, although minute, absolutely tiny, 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 you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pollen grains on an anther. It just takes one to sit on top of the stigma. And at this point, it grows a tube known as the pollen tube. And this orange uh, line here actually shows us the pollen tube growing from the top of the stigma down the style and into the store of the ovules. At this point, it's going in and in and in. Once it's got to this point, then the pollen tube uh, releases the male gametes. Um, and the male gametes are able to travel down the pollen tube and into the ovary. Once the pollen tube has grown, uh, the nuclei from the, uh, from the pollen grain are able to travel down the pollen tube and into the ovary. At this point, the male nuclei can fuse with the female nuclei, and at that point there, we would say that we have had fertilization of this flower. Now, what happens at that point is the rest of the reproductive part of this flower has done its job. There's no need for the plant to waste resources, keeping lovely, lovely, colorful petals or a source of nectar from this. And so literally, sepal die, uh, uh, dies and comes off, so there's the end of the sepal. The uh, petals will come off, and I can see if I can pull these apart, maybe not, um, it's a little bit tight on this one, but these will come off and die, uh, the anthers will come off, and you're just left with the ovary. And that will harden, and as the seeds inside here, the fertilized nuclei develop, um, this will then turn into the seeds for the, uh, for the next generation. The ovary will turn into the fruit of the plant. Welcome back. So hopefully you've seen the difference between pollination and fertilization. And you've seen that pollination is where the pollen lands on the stigma and fertilization is where the two gametes meet and fuse. So once we've met and fused, we've formed a zygote. That's the first initial cell of the new plant. That'll grow into a seed. The ovary will grow into the fruit. And then we want them to put the seed as far away from the parent plant as possible. And we call that seed dispersal. Now, wh why do we want the seeds to go as far away from the parent as possible? And, and that's because you don't want the offspring, the young plant, to be in competition for resources with the parent plant. You want it to be far enough away that they're not competing against each other. So there are, there are various different ways in which they could do this. And this is not to be confused with pollination vectors. Um, seed dispersal vectors and pollination vectors are two very different things. So there are, first of all, animal vectors. This is where plants use animals to carry the seeds as far away as possible. And the two methods I've put are the kind of hook method. So I've, I've got here some goose grass. If you ever come across goose grass, it kind of, it's really sticky stuff. You get it on your clothes and you can't get it off. And we've got a golden retriever. And when it gets goose grass in its hair, it's, it's forever to take it out of its coat. So it's, it's really quite effective. So they, they hook onto the fur. And when they get rubbed off, they, they, they're quite often miles away. So that is the seed dispersal with animals. The second way is that they are designed to be eaten. And so the seeds themselves have a coating that can cope with your stomach acid. You eat them. They pass through your digestive system, and then when you uh, poo, when you um, ingest the food, out it comes, and it's in its own layer of manure. So, you know, a bird will eat some raspberries, it'll fly away, and 30 miles later it'll poop out, and in that poop will be a seed um, covered with all the nutrients it needs to grow. So that, that's a very efficient way of doing it. Wind dispersal. Um, as it sounds, uses the wind to carry it as far away as possible. I've put two examples here. I've put a sycamore seed, which is like a helicopter. You, they drop off and they whirl round, and as they whirl round, they um, end up moving a far distance. And the second one I've put is a dandelion seed. You can see these are very light. They've got fluffy bits at the top that when the wind catches them, they disappear, dissipate on the wind, and off they go. They fly away. 
This is quite a cool method. There is an explosion method of seed dispersal. I've included two here of the exploding cucumber. If you get a chance to watch a video on exp exploding cucumbers, just do a search into YouTube and you get um, a picture. Then we've got the seed dispersal of an exploding pea. Um, both of those are worth watching. So th the idea of this is that the plant builds up enough tension in the, in the fruit so that eventually when the pressure gets too much, they explode and the seeds go flying in different directions. So that's quite cool. Now, I want you to do a task. The task that I want you to do is to make your own method of seed dispersal. For this, you're gonna need three bits of A4 papers plus some nuts, tape measure, and maybe some scissors. Um, I'm gonna quickly go into my dining room. I'm gonna show you what I want you to do and come back onto the video once you've done that. Right, for the experiment, you've got three bits of paper, you've got a pair of scissors, and you've got three seeds. For this one, I've used pepper mints. You can use bits of plasticine, it doesn't really matter. You can use nuts, it really doesn't matter. Now, what I'm asking you to do is to create three different methods of seed dispersal using these as seeds. Each method, you use a piece of paper and you can come up with whatever you want. It's, it's a creative exercise. So the easiest thing I could do is I put the seed in it, I'd scrumple the bit of paper up, there's my first advice. I can make a parachute out of this one, I can make some kind of helicopter out of it. It doesn't matter, try each three separate different methods. Then, you take this, I suggest outside so you've got wind, you stand on top of a chair carefully, make sure you've got your parents to help you, you lift up this as high as you can, and then drop it. And I want you to measure how far from the base of the chair each method goes and then come to the conclusion about which method was most effective at seed dispersal. Excellent, I hope you had fun with that and I hope you managed to get your seeds to move a, a fair distance. Um, anything over two meters with what you had is pretty good. So let's summarize, let's go through everything we've covered in this topic. Um, we've looked first of all at flowers. So we, we've talked about them being the sexual reproductive organs of a plant. And inside that flower, you've got male parts, which are called the stamen, and you've got female parts, which are called the carpal. They both produce gametes. Gametes, remember, means sex cells. Those two sex cells are pollen and ovules. Those are the names. Pollination is where pollen lands on the stigma, and it grows that pollen tube that goes down. The fertilization is when the two nuclei fix together and form a zygote. We have different pollination vectors that could be insect or wind, and that allows the pollen to go from one parent to another. When fertilized, it's the ovule that becomes the seed, the ovary becomes the fruit. We then have methods of seed dispersal so that the seeds can get as far away from the parent as possible. Brilliant, um, it's, that's been a long video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, hope to see you again soon. Bye bye.